Good morning and I greet you this good Friday morning in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. During the past week we have been able to spend times of prayer together lifting our nation and the nations of the world to the throne of grace. I presume you have been blessed and enriched as you have spent time in the presence of the Lord. This morning we want to look at God's word about the crucifixion as we reflect upon the wonderful gracious act of God in sending his own son into this world to die for us. So I would like you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew's Gospel chapter 27 and we'll be reading from verses 45 to 54. You will see it on your screen and I want to share with you about nature's narrative of grace. Nature's narrative of grace. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, reading from verses 45 to 54. And as we read it, just pay attention to the way we have arranged those verses. Okay, let's begin to read. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 45 to 54. Now from the sixth hour, until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. This is that wonderful account when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And you know, when Jesus was crucified, many things happened that were like acts of nature, which were inexplicable and were also quite shocking to the people of Jerusalem. I think that when these things happened, they must have been filled with consternation and fear. And when things happen that overtake us suddenly, we are filled with fear, just like all over the world, people are just struck by fear with what is going on. But even in the darkest moments of human history, when we think that there is no way out, and when we are gripped by fear, and we do not know which way to turn, there is God's grace always shining through. And in the next few minutes, I want to look at this text and explain to you God's narrative of grace and how God speaks through all the natural things that happened on that day purely because of His grace. Even the things that seemed quite fearful were actually expressions of His grace. And of course, the cross was the topmost 
incident of his grace. And so we read that when Jesus was crucified, from noon till three o'clock, the whole land was covered with darkness. I'm sure all the people were wondering what was going on. When the whole place was covered with darkness, and all the Jews would have known what that meant, because in their history, they always remembered the Exodus, and the ninth plague on Egypt was thick darkness over all the land of Egypt, so much so that they could not even get about. And that darkness was a statement about the hardness of heart of Pharaoh. This was the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. And then the tenth plague would be, the, would be when the Passover would be sacrificed. And when this darkness came over the whole city, I'm sure their minds went back to the time when there was judgment over Egypt. And yet, when Jesus was crucified, they have this darkness coming over their land, which is the land of Israel. And the whole place is covered, reminding them that this might be something that God is doing to enable them to understand the things that have just happened. The darkness would have been quite concerning. The darkness would have been quite difficult to deal with. But in the midst of that darkness, God was speaking to them. In the Exodus, the darkness was a judgment on Egypt. And here at the crucifixion was the darkness a sign of some kind of judgment on the people of Israel? It probably was. But that darkness could have waken them up to realize that even in the midst of this darkness, there was an opportunity for them to get their hearts and lives right with God. The wonderful thing about God is that even when there is judgment, there is always grace. Judgment is twinned with the grace of God. And this darkness served to remind them of what God was doing. Then as we read the text further, we see some other things that happened. By about noon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. At that moment, he departed from this life. And the moment that happened, several amazing things began to happen. The first thing that happened was the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now the veil of the temple was at least 30 feet long and 30 feet high. And it was probably at least four inches thick. So no human being could actually tear it up in a minute. The veil of the temple separated the temple from the most holy place or the holiest of holies to the rest of the temple. And nobody went through that veil except the high priest only once a year. But now, God was doing something. That thick veil was rent in two from the top, signifying that God was doing it. God was opening the door. He was creating the access for people to come into the presence of of God. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, we read that 
Jesus Christ's body is like the rent veil and he has opened the way, a new and living way so that all of us can have access into his presence. Now, this rending of the veil must have been quite a shocking thing for the people who observed it. But in that shocking moment of the rending of the veil, God was giving an amazing message, not only to the people of Israel, but to all of humanity, that through the crucifixion, through the death of Christ, all of us have the ability to have, have access into the presence of God. What a marvelous, great God we serve. The second thing that happened was that the earth quaked. The earth trembled. I'm sure that when this natural shaking, earth began to quake all around Jerusalem, the people were wondering what was happening because earthquakes were not as frequent then as they are today. And again, in the history of Israel, when a shaking took place, they understood fully well what happened. Because in Exodus 19, we read how when God called Moses to come up to the mountain so that he could give the tablets of stone to him, there were thunderings, lightnings and clappings and the people began to tremble just like the mountain began to tremble. And that was the inauguration of the covenant, the Old Testament covenant. And so when the earth shakes in a most significant and strategic fashion at this particular time, they were also able to understand that God is doing something again is part of God's narrative of grace. Though the earthquake may have caused some damage to houses, though the earthquake may have caused some fear and consternation, though the earthquake may have caused some people to tremble, yet for all, through that earthquake, God was speaking. God was speaking that there was an, an inauguration of a new covenant at this time through the crucifixion. Again, what a wonderful, gracious God we have. Some people may have got angry with God when the earthquake was going on. They may have shook their fist in hostility at him. But that which seemed like a judgment was actually a demonstration of his grace. Because through the earthquake, God was telling the people of Jerusalem who are responsible for the crucifixion of Christ that there was a new covenant that was being inaugurated. The cross, the crucifixion of that so-called criminal was going to change human history and bring people into the kingdom of God. There's another thing that happened. And that was, we read that the rocks were split well, that must have been a shocking thing happening all over Jerusalem and all of a sudden rocks began to split. First there is an earthquake, then there is the splitting of the rocks. Again, the people of Israel were familiar with the splitting of the rock because we remember the story in the wilderness when God was leading the people of Israel, they began to grumble about the lack of food and water. And the Lord got Moses to go to the rock and speak to it. And out of the rock came water. Amazing. Miracle took place. And that miracle proved that God was their provider, Jehovah Jireh. God was their protector and he was with them. And then in Exodus chapter 33, we read how God asked Moses to climb the rock and to get into the cleft of the rock. 
that he would be protected there as the Lord passes by. So the splitting of the rock, though it was probably a disturbing thing to the people of Israel mentally and emotionally, it reminded them of God's provision and God's protection. Again, what a wonderful statement of God's grace. And this is again the narrative of God's grace. Even when we are surprised and we are anxious at strange things that happen, it is speaking to us clearly about the grace of God. You know what it says to us? It teaches us that God uses multiple means to speak to his people so that they may realize who he is and come to him so that people who do not know him may seek him and come and get saved. This is the narrative, nature's narrative of grace because God speaks to every person even through nature. He speaks that he is there. He exists. And that he can deliver us from our sins. And then an amazing thing happened after that. This is nothing but supernatural. We read that the graves were open. What a fantastic thing to happen when Jesus has just departed from this world. Why were the graves open? The graves were opened to prove that death has been conquered by the death of Christ. Again, that is a statement of the grace of God. People fear death. And we can see that so clearly in our world today. But you know, as far as we are concerned, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, death holds no fears for us. And it really doesn't matter how a Christian dies. You may die through an accident, a person may die through a sickness, a person may die because of the coronavirus, and there are multiple ways in which you can die. Death is death, and you die only once. But the biggest thing about death is <clears throat> that when we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and because Jesus hung on that cross, and he said, it is finished. Death holds no fears for us anymore. Death is conquered in my life and in your life if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And then what happened? Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. You know, the Bible refers many times to death as sleep because Death is not the ultimate end for us. It is like a going to sleep for a while and waking up later. And when this, when the crucifixion took place, it says many bodies, not a few, but many bodies of the, probably the Old Testament saints, they were raised from the dead. I don't know when this happened, what effect it had on people. But the fact that many people who are Old Testament saints were raised from the dead when Jesus Christ died on the cross, it's a statement not only about the conquest of death, 
but also about the reality of the coming resurrection. And it is not that they were raised up in a spirit. They were raised up in their bodies. So this speaks to us about the bodily resurrection that will take place. And it actually took place when Jesus died on the cross. Not a few people, but many of them. And when what happened after that, they came out of the graves <clears throat> after his resurrection. Now Matthew writes this, uh, and uh, the, if you were to put a timeline, it probably, they didn't uh, come out of the graves and go into the city, into the holy city that same time, but it says, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city. After Jesus rose from the dead, these people who came out of the graves went into the holy city. Amazing thing. But you know, when you think about it, the Son of God died on the cross to pay for the sins of all humanity. So it is quite natural to expect that God would do some astounding supernatural things to accompany the events of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And so Matthew writes about the resurrection even during the crucifixion. Interesting. And these bodies of these people were raised, many of them, not a few of them, and they came out of the graves. The coming out of the graves actually is a reminder to us that one day Jesus will return and all those who are asleep in Christ and all of us who remain when he comes will be caught up together with him to be there and in the twinkling of an eye our mortal bodies will be transformed into glorious, immortal, eternal bodies. So the rising from the dead at that time is actually a supernatural narrative of God's grace. Then what happened? What did these people do? They appeared to many they went into the holy city and they appeared to many. There were many who were raised from the dead and many went to the city and appeared to people. I don't know what would have happened to people when they saw some people whom they thought were dead coming to meet them or appearing before them. Some would have got a shock. Some may have collapsed. Nothing is said about all that. But I'm sure that if that were to happen today, many of us would be surprised and shocked and we would not know what to do about it. Mind you, these are not spirits. These are real physical bodies. Real people who have been raised from the dead and they come into the city and they meet with people. Now, why did God do that? Why did God raise many people? and let them go and meet with so many people who were in the city. Because God is a God of grace. God is a God of mercy. This is the city that shouted crucify him. This is the city that condemned him. This is the city that falsely accused him. These are the people who conspired against the Son of God and put that terrible crown of thorns on his head and pressed it. These are the people who saw to it that he was lacerated, he was scourged, he was treated like a common criminal and they spat on him and asked him to prophesy and prove that he was the son of God by coming down from the cross. These are the people who ill-treated him so much and God could have given up on them, but he didn't. He didn't. What a wonderful story of God's grace. 
even to these people who are so obstinate, who are so blind, deliberately blind, and were so hardened against him despite all the miracles and wonderful things he did for all of them when he was on earth. He could have turned his face away, but no. God leaves no stone unturned to reach out to people. God will go the second mile and the third mile reaching out to people because he wants people to hear the good news, to turn to him and be saved, not lost eternally. God goes out of his way. He went out of his way on the cross. And what he did on the cross, he didn't do in secret, but he did it openly and publicly for the whole world to see. And then God gave abundant opportunities to the people who are directly responsible for what they did to him. What a demonstration of the grace, the love and the mercy of God. And then we read these wonderful words that when all these things happened, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly saying, truly, this was the Son of God. All these things proved to the people who were standing right by Jesus that he was the Son of God. I hope that they not only made that statement that he was the Son of God, but they bowed before him. I hope that they repented of their sins. I hope that they experienced a true conversion at that time and cried out to God. Because not everybody who makes mental assent to who Jesus is necessarily repents of their sin and experiences his grace. This is a great account, a narrative of the grace of God and a narrative of the supernatural activity of God in his desire to bring the truth of the gospel to people. What happened to Jesus didn't happen by accident. Jesus was not a helpless, helpless victim on that first Good Friday. Jesus was not crucified simply because Judas had such an insatiable lust for money. Jesus was not crucified because the chief priests and the elders and the religious leaders of Israel were baptized with envy and jealousy and hatred for who he was. Jesus was not crucified because Pontius Pilate wanted to satisfy the common people so that he would be popular. Jesus was crucified because God is good and God loves us and because God wants to save us from our sins and he wants to deliver us and he wants to deliver and save even the worst and even the worst people who oppose him. This is the message of Good Friday. And this shows us what a wonderful God we have whom we love and serve and that he will never let anything hinder him from showing us his love. He has done that on the cross. And dear friend, whatever situation you may be going through, darkness, earthquake, rock splitting, whatever it may be, confusion in your own heart and mind, remember that through all of that, God is speaking. And He's speaking not only through that, but the greatest way He speaks is through His Word and through the love that He has shown to us on the cross. On this Good Friday, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you are like the centurion and the others who are standing by, and all of a sudden they realize that this is the Son of God, is a great opportunity for you to bow before him and ask him to forgive you your sins and change your life and make you a child of God. If you are a child of God, if you are a disciple of Christ, 
and you are looking despairingly at your situation, wondering what the future holds. And I tell you that even in the darkest moments when there's thick darkness and when there is earthquake and rocks are splitting and unbelievable, unimaginable things are happy, happening all around you, that God is in control. His grace and His love shines through. And we just have to sit back and, and listen to Him and call upon His name and trust in His word. And now we're going to pray. See the face of God. And right where you are, you just shut yourself in with God and let the Lord speak to you as we speak to the Lord right now. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wonderful grace. Thank you for your narrative of grace that you gave at the crucifixion so that all human beings throughout history would know without a shadow of doubt that you are the Lord. So Father, I pray for anybody who may be right now listening to these words, to this message, and to and as they listen to these words and the Holy Spirit ministers to them, may they open their heart and cry out to you and experience your wonderful grace this very moment. Lord, lift every broken heart and heal it. Touch every wounded soul. And Lord, encourage everyone who may need your strength at this time by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you once again for the cross. Thank you for the victory of the cross. Thank you that not only did you die on the cross, but you rose again. And in that resurrection power, you are with us even today. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh uh -huh.